Oh, you just turned it off. Dr. Stanazi, you just turned the microphone off. You turned your microphone off. I decided to turn it on for you this time. <laughs> All right, you're good now. Yep. Okay, you Yeah. Yep. So that's what uh, uh, converging means for us. Now, there is nothing particular about n. Uh, if n is bigger than capital N, we have an minus L smaller than epsilon. If p is bigger than n, we have that a p minus L is less than epsilon. You can call your variable whatever you want. In particular, what I want is n minus 1. Okay, so I can put here n minus 1 larger than n, then a n minus 1 minus L is less than epsilon. Okay, whatever natural here is larger than capital N will give me a of that natural minus L less than epsilon. That's what the definition says here. So what I'm going to do now is I see that uh, uh, actually it's it, this is really a writing exercise. Uh, you are just playing with writing the definition. That's all. There is not much in terms of ideas. So what I want is to have a sequence Bn. And therefore, that's why I'm going to set n1. Let n1 be capital N plus 1. And then I'm going to say, well, if n is larger than n1, then a n minus 1 minus uh, L is going to be less than epsilon, which means that B n minus L is less than epsilon. So for a given epsilon, I have been able to find an n that I call n1, so that if n is bigger than n1, then B n minus L is less than epsilon. I'm done. I have proved that B n converges to L. Okay, in these problems, the, the, the only question is find a capital N. Because we found one, we are done. Questions? Yes? If we, um, could, could we also do it by showing that, um, uh, that AN is a subset of BN, or subsequence? It's not really a subsequence according to our definition. But it's, it's the right idea. I mean, it's, we could change our definition so that it's a subsequence. But in order to show that it's a, it is a subsequence, you need to find uh, J1, J2, and so on, so that, and your first J1 is supposed to be bigger than 1, so that uh, A n minus 1 can be written as A. A, J, N. And because of this N minus 1 thing, uh, first thing you need to start at 2, because A0 is not defined, or it may not be defined. And uh, so you, 
uh, you run into some trouble here to to make your definition of subsequence match with a n minus one. It's not like it's a, it. it, it it's possible to define the subsequence slightly differently from what we did. But I, I'd rather see a direct proof of that because it's, uh, it makes you think about what the definition says exactly. Okay, uh, second question uh, on this is generalization. Well, how do we generalize this? Uh, what we have done here is a shift of one, and uh, we prove that a n minus one converges to l. Uh, a shift of anything fixed should have the same result. Okay, so that's another, uh, that's one way to generalize. These questions about generalizations are vague, and sometimes there are several possible generalizations. Okay, so that's one that I find uh, natural, but you may find others. Uh, so define, so assume that an converges to L, uh, let k be a natural, then an minus k is also converging to L. And we imitate what we just did, and so for every epsilon, there is an n, so that if n is bigger than n, then a n minus l is less than epsilon. This time, what we want is n minus k bigger than capital N in order to, to put here n minus k instead of n. Therefore, we are going to say that n, 1, is n plus k instead of n plus 1. And therefore, if n is bigger than n1, then it means that n minus k is bigger than n, which means that a n minus k minus l is less than epsilon, which means that b n minus l is less than epsilon. So again, we have found our n1. We have found a capital N. We have proved that bn converges to L. Now, uh, this is a shift to the left. We could, of course, do things with a shift to the right. We could do a n plus k instead of a n minus k, and it would still work. What would I take for my capital N if I did that? N minus k. Oh, yes, you could take n minus k. You could simply take the same capital N. Because if n is bigger than capital N, then n plus k is also bigger than capital N, and you're done. OK, so the same capital N works. It's even easier uh, if you are doing a shift to the right. Okay, so that's another, you, you could, instead of doing a generalization like that, you could do a generalization where k is an integer instead of being a natural, and it would still work. Okay, number three. Um, so again, we have the same uh, hypothesis that uh, a n converges to a, and the crucial uh, observation here is that. 
uh, a n minus a is less than a n minus a. Remember, we proved that using the triangle inequality. I'm sorry. Yeah, previous homeworks. Yeah. So this, in turn, is less than epsilon for n larger than capital N. Therefore, we have this and a n in absolute value converges to absolute value of a. And we are done. Okay, so the crucial observation is really this triangle inequality. Because it tells you that absolute value of a n goes to a faster than what a n, than a n going to a. Uh, interestingly, the converse is not true in general. Exactly. So take a n to the minus one to the n, then absolute value of a n is one, and that converges to one. But a n does not converge. Now, in one particular case, it is a true statement. Which one? Uh, so, so you're suggesting a sequence a n equal to absolute value of a, a constant. Um, yeah. well, oh. How about a constant? Like three. Does that work for one over n? It doesn't work. Does it work for one over n? Well, no. Of course, if your sequence is positive, your absolute value is equal to your sequence, and you are not saying uh, anything. Okay. So, now what I, I was uh, uh, talking about is when your a is zero. What we have shown in, in the notes is that uh, if a n, a n goes to 0, if and only if absolute value of a n goes to 0. So that's a particular case. When the limit is 0, yes, showing that your absolute value converges to 0 is equivalent to showing that your sequence converges to 0. OK? So that's. that's uh, uh, a particular case where the converse is true. Then we have six. And we are assuming that a n converges to 1. And as for all problems in this section, you write down your definition. For every epsilon, there exists n, so that a n minus 1 is less than epsilon. Because we are trying to show an inequality, without absolute values, it's a good idea to get rid of the absolute value in your definition. And we know how to do that. That's simply saying that a n minus 1 is between minus epsilon and epsilon, which is? Is it OK um, for, for uh, to say, like, uh, you know, similar to the level on page 5 or? 
Oh, oh this, this the, going from here to here? Yeah. You don't need to justify it. I mean, once, you know, it's uh, in the public domain now, and uh, you okay. can just use it without uh, any copyright or something. <laughs> So you get your double inequality. And that's always too good to keep in mind. Okay? Sometimes you want the absolute value, sometimes you don't. So you need to have both points of view. And here, uh, what you can say is that this is true for every epsilon, because that's our definition. Okay? For every epsilon, we can find a capital N. And what you want in here is to show that an is less than 2. Well, because this is true for every epsilon, just set epsilon equal 1. That's a nice epsilon. It's a strictly positive. You can do this with it. What you cannot is pick epsilon equal 0 or negative epsilon in your definition, because that's not valid. Okay? But any positive epsilon is, is OK. And if you do that, you get to 2 which tells you that the an is less than 2 for n bigger than n. OK? So just an application of the definition. Now, some people were confused about this. So let me talk a little bit about uh, one mistake is to think, well, but why can you take a particular epsilon? Don't we say that we have to prove that this is true for every epsilon? So you need to be careful here. Here, this is given. You are told that an goes to 1. So this is true for every epsilon. Now, if I want to prove that an goes to 1, and I prove it only for epsilon equal 1, I haven't proved it. But that's a different question. OK? So do, do you see the difference here in, uh, in logic? In one case, this is given, you use it. In the other case, you need to show it, and then, no, you cannot pick a particular epsilon. You know, you, knowing how to prove it for your favorite epsilon is not good enough. You need to prove it for every epsilon. OK? So you can also pick an epsilon between 0 and 1? Anything you want. That is fine. And, and that's what you need to do for B. Yeah. So for B. Question. Yes. When I was doing this myself, I used the, uh, basically, the proof for the convergence sequence, uh, convergence sequence is bounded, where we had the absolute AN. So I got to the point where I had absolute AN is less than 2. And then I went and solved B. And since B was showed it was greater than 1 half, I said that. And it came back to A and said, because of that, it would have to, A of N would have to be less than 2. Uh, well, it's probably an, uh, a more complicated way to do it. But uh, I'll, I'll look at it. Okay. So for B, you would do exactly the same thing. You get the same double inequality. But this time, you want to show that an is bigger than half. So you're going to pick epsilon equal half. And you get that an is bigger than 1 minus half, which is half, for n larger than. And of course, it's not the same capital N. You have one capital N for epsilon equal 1. You have another one for uh, uh, epsilon equal half. But it's uh, exactly the same thing that you write down. OK? So that's for 6. Now for 8. 8 is slightly different because you want to construct a sequence here. So what you are told is that um, you have a greater slower bound k and you want to show that you have 
a sequence in A converging to K. Now, the main point here is that your sequence is in A. Because I'm always able to find a sequence that converges to K. OK, like uh, K plus 1 over N is a sequence that converges to K. But that's not answering my question. Because I don't know that K plus 1 over N is in A. And I want my sequence to be in A. OK? So that doesn't answer the question in this case. Again, because K plus 1 over N may or may not be in A. We don't know. So we need to work a little harder to find a sequence in A. How do we do that? Well, we uh, do inductively. We say, for instance, that K plus 1 is not a lower bound of A. It's not because this is my greatest lower bound. K plus 1 is bigger than the greatest, therefore it's not a lower bound. If it's not a lower bound, then there is A in A, in capital A, such that A is less than K plus 1. Yes? Okay, you can find someone smaller than k plus 1. If you cannot, then this means that k plus 1 is a lower bound, and <coughs> therefore k is not a lower bound. So, uh, because this is the first one I found, let's call it a1. Okay, I'm going to label it. I'm trying to, bu to build a sequence, so let's call it a1. Then uh, what else can we say? We can say that k plus half is not a lower bound. Same reasoning as before. So there is a 2 in A, so that A2 is strictly uh, less than k plus half. And I can continue this for every 1 over n. I can say that k plus 1 over n is also not a lower bound. Because k plus 1 over n can be fairly close to k, but it's still strictly bigger than k. And therefore, it cannot be a lower bound. So that there is a n in a such that an is bigger than k plus 1 over n, uh, smaller than. So you see the, the, the naive idea to say I'm going to take k plus 1 over n and it converges to k doesn't work. But it's almost that, because you can find a sequence uh, which is less than k plus 1 over n, and that converges to k for the following reason. We have that a n is always larger than k. That's because my sequence here is in a. This is in a. And this is a lower bound of a. So the lower bound is always less than everything which is in a. And then this is, by construction, less than k plus 1 over n. So this goes to k because it's a constant. This goes to k because 1 over n goes to 0. And therefore, a n goes to k. And we are done. OK, so we have, we have a sequence that converges to k. Exactly. This is the, the squeezing principle that we are using here.
questions? How would you describe the ASA bin then in this new sequence? So you cannot, you, we don't get an explicit uh, f expression for AN. We don't know what it is. It's going to depend on what your set capital A is. And it could be something quite intricate. We, we are only showing the existence of the sequence and the fact that it converges to K. So it's less uh, satisfactory than uh, K plus 1 over N, which is very clear. But it's uh, interesting because it's in your set. And every time you have a greater slower bound or least upper bound, you can find a sequence that converges to, to that number. And that's going to be quite useful in, in, uh, when we'll be looking at uh, uh, using least upper bounds, greatest lower bounds. It would be very useful to, to use this property uh, that we can find a sequence converging to it. Other questions? So this was 8, and now 11. So 11, you know that your sequence converges to 1. And you know that uh, it can only take the values 0, 1, and 2. So it's jumping around, maybe, and uh, converging to 1. And what we want to show is that after a while, it stays put at 1. And the reason it does is because, according to our definition, a n is going to belong to this to some interval, whatever uh, interval we pick, after for n bigger than capital N. So you know that your a n is going to be inside here. And if you pick your interval like this, where it doesn't include 0 or 2, you have no choice but to stay put at 1. OK? Because it cannot go to 0, it cannot go to 2, and the only remaining possible value is 1. So it's really the same problem as 6. Because you want to, sh to say that your sequence is between 1 half and 3 half, let's say, and the only value between 1 half and 3 half which is allowed is 1. And therefore, you stay at 1. That's all. So let's write it. Can we, uh, can we use uh, epsilon equal to like 1? Yeah, that would work that too. Because it's a uh, strict uh, inequality? Exactly. OK. Cool. Yeah, that's if, if you are not afraid to live in the boundary. But yeah, the strict inequality saves you. So, epsilon equal half, for instance, we know that there exists an n, so that for n bigger than capital N, then a n minus 1 less than half. So a n belongs to one half, three half, for o n larger than n, but at the same time a n must belong to the set zero, one, and two. 
gate must at the same time belong here and here. The only intersection between these two is one. There is no other way. So an must be one for n larger than capital N. So what I should have asked is what is the generalization of this result? How would you generalize this? Yeah, that's going to be true. I mean, the proof is going to hold true for any fraction. How about for any set of naturals where it uh, it um, converges to uh, a specific so, one of them? So, you take a sequence which can only have natural values, right. okay, and you want your sequence to converge one of those well, you, do you really need to say to one of those naturals? I, I don't think you even need that. You just say, I'm going to take a convergent sequence in the naturals, and I'm going to show that it stays put after a while. Okay. Okay? So that's a bonus problem for you. Did you say for any finite sequence? Well, I guess the fact that it's not the natural. Oh. Oh. Well, if you have finitely many values possible, yes, that's going to work. Uh, and that's another generalization. Um, the, the thing here, the main thing, is that it's a sequ that you, your jumps, the jumps of your sequence, are you have a, a minimum jump. That's, that's the thing. Uh, from one value to the other, you your uh, what what makes this work is the following. You said you don't have infinite density. No, it's that the distance between the different values is bounded below by one. And every time you are in a set where you have that the distances between your different values cannot be arbitrarily small, you are going to have this property. Because you take epsilon smaller than the distances, the possible distances, and uh, it uh, makes your sequence stay put at some point. So that's, that's really, I think, the most general uh, way to look at it. Well, if, uh, if we pick some uh, set of numbers that doesn't have infinite density. What do you mean by infinite density? that you can always uh, cut uh, the space between uh, two values inside of it. Uh, yes, you can always have another value somewhere in between. So you have oh, you are talking, uh, so, so you are talking about a, a set which is not dense in the reals. Uh, yeah, it could be in the reals, it could be something, it could be, you know, a uh, set that's not dense of rationals. That's not infinitely dense. It's like 1.3. You have those two infinite dens density of the rational numbers and density of the irrationals. Mm -hmm. So if you pick anything that doesn't have that density, mm -hmm. there'll always be a way to split it and use this. No, I don't think so. But uh, we, we may talk about it afterwards. But uh, I, I don't think that's enough. OK, so uh, let's go to 2.2 which is monotone sequences. What we call monotone sequence is either a sequence which is increasing or decreasing. So a n is said to be increasing. If 
an is less than an plus 1 for all naturals n. When I want a strict inequality, I'll, I'll say strictly increasing. Okay, so for me, increasing means that it can be equal. It can stay stationary. That's fine. That's also an increasing sequence. And of course, decreasing sequence So this is a very strong property. In general, uh, the sequence uh, that you'll have, you cannot assume they are either increasing or decreasing. They, they will go up and then down and then up again. And uh, uh, they may con be convergent or not. That's, not. that's a separate issue from monotone. Uh, so for instance, well, let's look at it. Couple of examples. So minus one over n to the n is not monotone. Okay, so monotone avoids us to have to say it's not decreasing nor increasing. And uh, it's clear because it's going to fluctuate, therefore, this is not going to be monotone, but it's convergent. Okay, as we have observed. Uh, the sequence a n equal to n, for instance, is increasing. But not convergent. How would I argue that uh, a n equal n is not convergent? It's not bounded, exactly. It's not bounded and therefore it cannot be convergent. Now, uh, when do I have a monotone sequence, uh, a convergent monotone sequence? Well, there, there is a, an important result, which is the following. If an is increasing and bounded above, so what does bounded above mean? Well, an is less, there is There is k so that an is less than k for all n, then an converges. Okay, intuitively, it should be clear you have something increasing and you have a bound. Therefore, it must converge. I mean, it cannot really uh, go anywhere because it's bounded and it's increasing. Okay, so the difference between bounded above and bounded is remember, when we say that uh, a sequence is bounded, it's when its absolute value is less than k, which is the same as saying that it's really bounded below and bounded above. Okay, so you have to be a little careful about this terminology. Uh, because it's increasing, we are interested in bounded above only. We don't care about bounded below. And of course, when it's decreasing, it's bounded below. That's uh, the interesting uh, uh, notion. So the proof of this theorem is uh, uh, interesting in that it uses the fundamental property of the rails crucially. And uh, what the, the difficulty here is the following. You know that your sequence is increasing. You know that it's bounded above. But 
what is a possible candidate for my limit? I have no idea. I, n I don't know what uh, the sequence looks like. How am I going to be able to say, well, it converges to L? What is L? I mean, that's uh, really how do I find this thing? And that's where the fundamental property comes to my rescue because what I can do is look at the range of a sequence. Okay, we look at all the possible values of uh, our sequence, and these values are increasing. And the least upper bound of this set is going to be my limit. Okay, that's, that's how I'm going to find the limit. Uh, so in order to, to use the fundamental property, I need to check a couple of things. A is different from the empty set, of course, because A1, for instance, belongs to A. Okay, I have all the A's, so I, I, I take my favorite one and I say that it's in there. And then A is bounded above or has an upper bound by k because everybody in here is less than k. And these are the two properties I need to check. So by the, now I use the fundamental property of the reals. And I say a has a least upper bound Questions? Do you see why I'm taking the upper bound, not the lower bound? Yeah. It's increasing. Because it's increasing. So if I if I picture things, then I have a one here, a two here, and uh, so on. And uh, clearly, if I have a limit, it must be you know on the upper bound. Uh, side of things, right? The lower, the lower bound is not very interesting. There is not much happening here. There is only the first A's, but where uh, the action is, is where the A ends as N gets big R, which is here. So now that I have found a number, I'm going to use this number to show that this is actually my limit. Okay, now I have a number to work with. So our first step was to find L. Second step is show that AM converges to L. Now that we have L, we can do that. So as always, let's pick an epsilon. And our first step should be to say, well, uh, as always, we've uh, least upper bounds and the uh, greatest lower bounds, uh, we are going to say that L minus epsilon is not an upper bound. Right? L is the least upper bound, L minus epsilon is not an upper bound. Therefore, There is an A in my set such that A is bigger than L minus epsilon. However, uh, the elements in my set are A ants. Okay, so instead of calling it A, I'm going to say, well, there is A capital N. And, uh, 
the capital N is going to be the usual capital N I'm looking for. Okay, but I'm just calling it A capital N because it's it's one of the ANs which is in A and that has this property. So at this point, what do I know? I know that there is a term of my sequence which is certainly uh, larger than L minus epsilon and less than or equal to L. But if you pay attention, uh, we haven't used the fact that this is an increasing sequence yet. The only thing we have used is that this is a bounded sequence. It's bounded and therefore we can do everything we, we have done so far. And now we are going to use that it's an increasing sequence in order to show that if our n is larger than capital N, we have uh, the same thing here going on. So, now take n larger than capital N, then a n is larger than a n. Okay, it's an increasing sequence. Therefore, if n is bigger than capital N, we must have this inequality to hold. And now we uh, do the following. We say that, uh, what do we say? So we say that the a n is larger than so we know that an is bigger than l minus epsilon. So an is bigger than l minus epsilon as well, which means also that uh, an is between l and l no. is between L minus epsilon and L. So this is the upper bound of my set. Therefore, that's true for any element in my sequence. And this is just what I wrote here. And we get a n minus L. Well, what should I do here? I should do L minus a n instead. So what do we get from here? We get L minus AN positive. From this inequality, I get that L minus AN is positive. And from this one, I get that L minus AN is less than epsilon. Now we have a double inequality. We have a double inequality L minus AN positive and less than epsilon. Because this guy is positive, I can say that it's equal to its absolute value. So we get that L minus AN is less than epsilon for N larger than capital N. And that proves that AN converges to L. Okay, did I succeed in losing you in the inequalities there, or are you, are you with me? I'm with you. I'm sorry? I'm with you. Okay, that's one. What about the 39 others? So do you want me to, to go over this again? Uh, so this is the fact that it's increasing. That's what we're using here. Then. Uh, we have this double inequality. Now, if you look at this inequality here, and you put your an on this side, you get L minus an positive. You look at this one, you put your minus epsilon on this side, and an on this one, and you get L minus an less than epsilon. So you get your double inequality here. Because it's positive, you can put absolute values. 
and u are less than epsilon. And this is, of course, a n minus l, because the opposite of this number has the same absolute value. So we, we get uh, exactly our endpoint to show that we have convergence. Okay, so this is a, n a nice result and an important one uh, because if you are able to show uh, that you have a monotone sequence, then you have convergence provided it's bounded. So let's state what happens for decreasing sequences now. So if an is decreasing and bounded below, which means that there is k such that an is bigger than k for all n, then an converges. And of course, the, uh, I stated only one implication for both properties, but the converse is obviously true because if your sequence converges, being monotone or not, it must be bounded. So the converse of these uh, properties is true, but we knew that anyway, so we don't. Uh, so this will probably be part of your homework where you have to adapt uh, what we did for increasing sequences. And then we have this mix. Okay, so homework for 2.2 will be one week from today. The, what is it? 21st. It's a bad sign when I don't remember how to do the thing, but uh, I'm sure you'll figure it out. Okay, so you have this stare again that begs me to stop, so I'm going to stop. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.